All right. Well, uh, last week what we talked about was the very beginning of the story of Luke. Um, as Luke wants to tell everybody the story of Jesus, he begins with the story of John the Baptist. And so what we learned last week was that uh, Zechariah w- was a priest. He was a priest out in the, the Judean countryside, the, the rural area. And it's his turn to come in and be a part uh, of going into the, to the Holy of Holies and, and, and doing the incense offering there. And so he comes into Jerusalem and he's doing that. It's his turn. And all of a sudden the angel Gabriel comes to him. And the angel Gabriel says, hey, you're going to have a son and you're going to name him John. And what we learn about Zechariah is he is, as the Bible says, near death. He is so old. The the Bible says he is in his severe old age near death and that his wife is the same and that they have been barren their whole lives. And so we we talked about last week, you know, this is literally like the angel coming to the nursing home and going, good news, you're having a kid. And, And them going, yeah, I don't think so. Um, and that's literally his response is, is he, the angel Gabriel tells him, you're going to have a son. You've been praying your whole life for this and you've been ostracized for this because we talked about in this culture and in this time period, if you don't bear a son, if you don't bear children, you're seen as cursed or there's something wrong with you or God is punishing you. You have some secret sin. And so that's what's going on. And so all of a sudden they're in, in their old age, Elizabeth and Zachariah find out that while they are near death old, they are going to have a child. And Zachariah's response, standing before an angel, is, yeah, I don't really know if that's true. And the angel goes, I, I'm Gabriel, who stands before the throne of God. I'm telling you this is going to happen. And because you doubted me, you're going to be mute until the day this happens. And so he comes out, and everybody can tell because he can't speak, and he's just motioning to them that something has happened, that he has seen something. And that's where the story ended last week. And so it's going to continue this week uh, with this. And we'll read from uh, Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 23. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. This is talking about Zechariah. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant. So what what he said could never happen, happens. And she became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared in her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. And they said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to the father. I love this. Who is the one that can't speak? Zechariah. Yet when they try and communicate with him, what are they doing? Think about that for a second. Yeah. So they're making signs to him. He's the one that can't speak. He can still hear. Anyways, um, they're making signs to him and to find out what he would like to name the child. He, he asked for a writing tablet. And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the, hills, the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all of these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. And this is such a cool ending, but this isn't where it ends. What happens next is Zechariah, now that his tongue is loosened and he can speak, he actually stands over and sings a song of prophesying and praying over his child, saying, this is what God has said this child is going to be. And he lists a whole bunch of things and unbelievable things. And some of the highlights of it, um, he says that his child... This, this son, this John, that he's going to be uh, the one who prepares the way for the Lord. He's going to preach and give the knowledge of salvation to people. That he is going to bring forgiveness of sins to people. And then we, we know from later in the text that this son that he, he is having is going to actually be the one to baptize Jesus. I mean, when you talk about something incredible, he is going to be the one that baptizes Jesus And he is going to stand up to the ruler of the area and he is going to tell him he's wrong. He's going to be an incredible man. Thousands are going to come to be baptized by him. And the interesting thing is, if we were to ask you the question tonight, 
Who is the greatest person ever born? Most of you would probably get the answer right. It is Jesus. Jesus is the greatest person ever born. Who is second? Who is second on that list? And it's interesting, we, we would be revealing our heart as to what we think is significant because if we think it's the most successful person in the world, we would have a list of those people. If we think it's the, the most spiritual or, or life-changing people, we would have you know, the Mother Teresa's in, in that list. If we think it's the strongest person ever, we would have you know, someone you know, like me, my physique or something. No, we, we would have like the Arnold Schwarzeneggers. Or, you know, what would our criteria be? And it's interesting if we can all agree on the first one, that Jesus is the greatest person ever born. Jesus himself says, the greatest person born of a woman is John. To have our Lord and Savior say the greatest person born, besides himself, is John. That's truly something incredible. And so the whole town is saying, there is something, all of this that's happened, there's something unbelievable. But tonight, the one point I want us to walk away with is this. When we talk about John, who Jesus says is the greatest of women ever born, one of the words that describes John the most throughout the scriptures is humility. Humility. And one of the famous verses where John really shows his humility is this. Um, after Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside. So Jesus and his disciples are, are right there where John and his followers are as well. And John's already baptized Jesus. He, he's, he's already done these things. He, he's pretty well known. People come from all over to be baptized by him. And so John has this incredible ministry growing and, and tons of people and followers. And Jesus is there right down the, the riverbed from him. And his disciples are baptizing people. And John's disciples come to him and they say, hey, hey, look, Jesus' people are, are baptizing people. People are going over there to be baptized by him instead. And this is a huge moment because he has quite a following. He's got a lot of followers. He's got a lot of power. A lot of people listen to him. And John says these incredible words. He says, speaking of Jesus in verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. And when we talk about one of the most incredible things about John, if we can learn one lesson from his life, it is his humility, that he is the humble servant. And it's interesting, humility, we, we sometimes confuse humility to think it means to have no ambition. That humility means, well, I, I don't strive for anything. I, I'm just okay with being nothing. But that's not what humility is. Um, we, we, we think it's unwilling to aspire to greatness. But humility is that you are willing to aspire to greatness in a way that pleases God that you're willing to aspire to greatness in a way that pleases God. And what's interesting where we find our evidence for this is elsewhere in the Bible, people come up to Jesus and they say, they ask him, who is the greatest? And he doesn't rebuke them saying, how dare you try and be the greatest? He actually answers their question. And he says, the greatest will be the one that's willing to be the least of these. The greatest is the one who's willing to be the humble servant and serve them all. And when we look at John and when he tells us that John is the life, the, the greatest born of women that we ought to emulate, in this Christmas season, one of the things that we ought to try and emulate is our humility. One of the things that we can strive for is this, that we would live a life where we would constantly be saying, he must increase and I must decrease. In our finances, in our, our agenda, in our Christmas season, everything. Can we find the space where we say, he needs to increase here and I need to decrease? And that's the beauty of who John is. And the greatest testimony that we have is this, that when Zechariah is prophesying and singing, he says these words, on those living in darkness, those in the shadow of death, a sun is rising. And if we can just take the imagery of that and picture pitch darkness and brokenness and sadness and filth and shame and sorrow and then picture that that first glimmer of sun rising that's what advent is advent literally is celebrating coming and this this coming this celebration this salvation this light coming into the darkness it takes humble servants to spread that news to make it happen it takes people willing to say I need to decrease and he needs to increase at this time. And so that's our prayer tonight.